This is Assis and Allies Guadalcanal on the Two or Less channel and a, a how to play ish video. Um, the reason why it's an ish, well, this game is different from other regular Axis and Allies games and really it's a departure from the other campaign games too. Um, the turn order, the economy, the combat, it's all alien and it took me a while to make the switch. So I hope this video will help flatten that learning curve for you. Um, it's not a complete read through of the rules. They're easy enough to understand. Um, I've been merely trying to, to point you in the um, the right direction because if you played any uh, regular Axis and Allies games, and I assume that you, you have, um, then you're going to carry the baggage of what you expect from those through to, to Guadalcanal. And um, when I first started playing this, I found myself often double, triple checking the rules, thinking, did I read that? Well, that's not what I was expecting. Um, and the game doesn't take you to where, is it, where you expect to go to. So I just hope this is gonna, it's gonna help you out. And this version I'm playing on is the old original um, Access and Allies uh, Avalon Hill version, not the reprinted Renegade one. There are some small differences between the Renegade version and the old version. They are mainly component and errata and clarification ones. There was one major errata in the original version. I, I'm assuming that Renegade have sorted that out. The, the, the game comes out in a couple of weeks' time. It may already be out now by the time you get to watch this video. And um, they got some um, airfields on the, the base game and the original game, etc. They are important components in, in the game. And the original version, you have got a functional side and a damage side and control is what will help you to win this game. Um, but you have to remember who controls which which side, whether it's the Americans or the Japanese. In the upgraded version, Renegade have printed flags on both sides of these, so you can flip them over to control it and put your damage onto it with damage tokens. It's a much better idea than the original version. I'm quite jealous of those. I may have to print some of these up myself in a, in a rock and roll fashion. Um, but, as I said, what I've been trying to do is, is run you through these rules to, to get you over any of those, those odd hurdles that caught me out. I won't be giving away any strategies. I'll let you have the pleasure of discovering those for you, for yourselves. Um, before we get going, may I mention that I make these videos in aid of a charity called Cure Parkinson's. You can guess what they're trying to do. There's a link to them below this video, one in the About section on the channel page. If you haven't ever spare a dollar, you are yen yak, or British pound you can send to them, I am sure that they would appreciate it. So, as I mentioned before, airfields are what you're trying to capture. They give you victory points. It is a victory point game. It is a first past the post. There are certain rules for ties. Look them up in the rule book. They won't happen very often. You also get victory points um, if you knock out an opposition's capital ship. That's the, the battleships and the, the carriers. Um, but more of that later. It's a three-phase game. Rather than the five, six, seven even in G40, was it phases in the regular games? There's just three phases in this game, movement, combat, and regroup, that's it. There's no purchase and repairs, no non-combat moves, it's just those three phases in there. This game invites strategic and tactical challenges that um, I've, I've not quite met before uh, in an Axis and Allies game of, of this, this um, kind of level. Um, you've got to be quick to react, quick on your feet because um, mainly because of the auto combat sequence where casualties are removed in steps. You may have flown your massive air wing over to do, to do damage to a fleet and then find out that their anti-aircraft gun wreck your air wing before you've had a chance to drop your bombs and put your fighters into battle. Um, and so your good plans can be in tatters in, in seconds. And if you mix that up with the um, optional rule of advantages that are in the appendix on this book, um, you can have a different game every time you play it. And I, I really enjoy playing with those, um, those optional rules. But apart from a bit of um, admin, nearly every step is played um, alternating fashion, you go, I go. And um, it's Japan goes first on the first turn, then America goes within those steps, you go, I go. And you switch it around in, in the second uh, turn of the game, 
America goes first, Japan goes first, then back again. You can see, you know how alternating works. I haven't got to explain how alternators work. Uh, but anyway, Japan goes first on the first turn of the first phase. And well, that is when I started flicking through the rule book and, and find, found it, finding myself not trusting myself. So what I suggest you do um, is try to get rid of your previous ANA baggage that you're going to bring forward and trust and don't overthink the rule book. Go through it in step by step by step and it drops into place pretty quickly. So we get on to the um, phase one movement, step one, load and move transports. Japan go first on the first turn. Japan have, say, a transport ship and some people and some supplies they want to move. There's more than that on their base card, I can assure you. There's also more units around the board, I can assure you of that too. But they simply load them and move them. They move one space. They do not unload in this phase. Unloading happens later on. They also only move the one space. All Navy move one space. After Japan have done that, America might do a similar thing. They've already got some transport ships down here in this sea zone. They already have some people on this island. They may want to move those into this sea zone. Japan goes, America goes. Then the battleships may move. Japan begin with a battleship somewhere back here. It can move that into this sea zone by this connecting arrow there. America land. They begin with a battleship, put it on the baseboard, move it in. After the battleships have moved, then your carriers move. Japan's carriers can move in. If it happened to have had aircraft with it, and they do begin with the aircraft, aircraft that are loaded on carriers move with the carrier. It doesn't cost them anything to do that. Rather than having to fly up into the air and then move as in the regular games you're expecting, they move with the carriers. Carry here from America does the same thing. It's going to move into this sea zone. Why not indeed? After the carriers have moved, Japan can move its cruisers one space. Let's say into there. Nothing happens. Nothing at all happens. They've just moved their cruiser into there. America can move their cruiser in. If you're going to go cruising, I'm going cruising too. Then we come to the load and move destroyers. Yes, load and move destroyers. A little bit like, um, I think it was the original Pacific game where Japan only could move um, infantry units on, on their destroyers. In this case, you can load and move any unit onto your destroyers. You can move a supply token, you can move an artillery, anti-aircraft gun. The destroyers act as makeshift transport units. So Japan do that, and America, well, they're going to take something with them destroyer-wise into this battle. When you've done that, you now get the rather rude insertion of combat into the middle of a, of a movement phase. And I understand why, they've done it, and I quite like why they've done it in this game. Um, submarines have their own set of special rules. Submarines move and attack straight away. No reply. So the submarine could, from Japan's first, move into, if it began over here, but it doesn't do it, get over there. But it can move into one space and make its attack straight away on a targeted unit. Once they've done that, America could move its submarine. One does begin in here, into here. It could target the submarine or the cruiser there and roll a dice in combat. Then we come on to the air movement of this phase. The first thing that moves is the bombers. Bombers move three, fighters move two. Half the regular amount that you're expecting to find, but you do not have to demonstrate a landing space. You just move them. The landing comes in a special phase at the end of the game when they get the other half of the movement. And generally speaking, if you moved out, you've got enough range to move back again. It's one move, say, from an airbase here, if there was an airbase with a bomber on it. One move would go one into there, two and three. There are spaces you can't fly over. They have no entry marks. It's the same as the Navy can't fly through these gaps, but they have a movement of three. So from your base card, from your island down here, the bomber will go one into the water, two into that space, and three over that island, or three into that sea space, over there. 
Of course, Japan would have gone first. That's me, me. <laughs> get one way around. We put Japan fight a bomber over there. After that becomes the move, the um, fighters phase. Fighters move two. Let's just say they are on their base card. They would move um, one off the island into this into the sea and one into this sea space here. America would do the similar thing. If they had a, an air base here and a fighter, they could move one, two, or just the one into there. That would be the end of all the movement. It all happens, as I said to you, alternating, you go, I go, and switch around who goes first later on. So let's move on to combat. Combat is resolved one space at a time at the first player's behest. Again, it's you go, I go in combat. But on the first turn, it's Japan who decides which space is gonna be attacked in first. The attacks are done in four steps and the first or even second time um, of playing this game, three of those steps caught me out. Step one is attack air units. It is not air units attack, it is attack air units. Whichever piece of military hardware is in a space that can hit uh, air units will be trying to do just that. Be it fighters or bombers over a land or sea space, someone will be having a pop at them, if at all possible. Combat is done by loading your dice into your battle box. The reverse side of the battle box gives you the values that each of the units will be using in terms of the dice loaded into the battle box to try to hit units in the relative theatres. For instance, in an air attack, the anti-aircraft gun will be rolling three dice. Bombers and fighters roll one and two dice respectively. Destroyers, cruisers and battleships all get one dice to throw into the action. Now, I don't like this battle box. I've got my own system using a tube. There's a system video going up with this sometime shortly. Um, you may use that or use this battle box, whatever you want to do. So if you're using this uh, rattly noisy battle box, you would load your dice into the box, you rattle it around a little bit and you draw this tube out of it with the um, values of the dice, sorry, with the compartments giving you the positions of the dice and the um, registers along here telling you which units in the theatres you are hitting. For quickness, I've set this up just here and we shall pretend that these have been rolled in this tube and drawn out as per these positions on the, um, on the card. Remember, it is not the usual values of destroyers hitting at a two or less or battleships hitting at a fours. Um, it is the number of dice that you can load into this tube and rattle around and get your values for what gets hit in combat. So as we are in the attack air units step of phase two, the combat phase, Japan going first on their battle box can attack these two American air units that are in there. Japan can use a bomber, a fighter, and the anti-aircraft guns from these pieces of shipping. So we have one, two, three, four, five from the fighter, and a sixth attack dice from the bomber. We would roll these dice in the tube, wrap them around, pull the tube out, and we get these results here. A result of a one or a two in nearly all cases is a hit. In fact, in all cases, it is a hit, but there are some exceptions between the ones and the twos. We shall come to those later. So in this case, we got a hit here on this, this value of one and a hit here on this value of one. Checking up against the register, one fighter has been hit and one bomber has been hit. So the American bomber and the American fighter will get removed from this battle after this, the battle has been resolved in this space. So the rest of those dice that were in that tube wouldn't be mattered. You wouldn't have actually pulled them out that draw that far anyway because you don't need to do any more than the, the, see the six dice that you've rolled in this case. If, however, America land didn't have the bomber and the fighter, they had two fighters involved in that battle, this hit here, which is on a bomber, couldn't be assigned. What you would do with that then is you take that hit, 
you go back to the start of the box to the number one register and you slide along until you come to a unit that can be hit by that one, in this case, the second fighter. That is the way that the combat works with unassigned dice. It's the same if you were doing that in the sea theater or in the land theater. If you've got hits on destroyers and, and, and transports, whatever it is, that they aren't available in that battle or have already been destroyed in that one battle, then you would take your dice back to the first register and slide it along um, out or into place. After Japan have now finished their, um, their air attack units, America will get to do their attack back on Japan. And its attack values, again, it's the same dice numbers here. We have uh, anti-aircraft guns from the shipping, one, two, three. We have one from the bomber, makes four, and five, six from the fighter. Let's throw in the mother American fighter in just for a laugh, seven, eight dice against the Japanese. Once you finish the attack in that space, you then move on to an air attack in another space. Once you resolve those attacks in all the um, air spaces, you then go on to the attack C units phase. And then the C attacks or attack C units, C units can be hit by artillery. If America land had an artillery unit in Guadalcanal, it can fire out to sea into this space. It could fire out to sea in this space as well or backwards but it can only be used to attack one C space. You can't move the gun around really nearly. It can be added, it's one dice to an attack in the C zone that it's pointing towards. But the artillery could also be used later on in a land attack on Guadalcanal in, a, in the land attack phase. So remember that artillery can be used in naval attacks. It's tripped me up more than once. So in the attack C units phase, we have um, the artillery with one dice. Bombers have two dice, fighters have one dice. From the shipping, destroyers have one dice, cruisers two dice, and battleships have three dice in which to attack naval units in the attack C units phase. So in this case, we have the submarine here it's already had its attack in that earlier movement phase. That's lost and gone. But we have a three dice from our battleship, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine dice for Japan to load into the battle box and start throwing those at the Americans. So fiddling around with my battle box just by a touch here. These are the, the nine dice out of the 12 that the Japan will be throwing at the Americans. We will ignore these dice up here, they're not part of it. Japan's results have one hit on the destroyer down here, so America would lose this destroyer. There is a hit here on the battleship and a hit on the transport, but battleships ignore the first hit, they have heavy armour. Additional to that, a hit of ones and twos make a big difference in combat. A hit of a one is a destroy. The unit is destroyed and removed at the end of combat. A hit of a two will damage most of the shipping. We have resilience, what is known as, on the carrier, on the battleship, on the cruiser and on the destroyer. If they are hit with a value of two rather than a value of one, they are moved to the damage box on the um, base card and can be repaired later on with a supply. The twos and ones also make a difference when it comes to hitting transporting units, which is the transporters and the um, destroyer, which can move one unit as well. A hit of a one is going to destroy the things, but it is the attacker that chooses which of the um, ships it wants to hit if it has a multiple choice. In this case here, Japan would probably want to hit this transport ship carrying the two artillery rather than the ship carrying the two infantry. So hit of a one, Japan is probably going to choose that. If the hit was at a two, America would probably choose that ship to go down. And of course, to mark the, um, the um, heavy armor hit that is ignored by the battleship, just roll it on your side and it gets repaired at the end of the battle should it survive. Also, 
If a unit gets hit at a two, and I mentioned they get um, damaged rather than destroyed, if they are hit twice in the same round of combat on say a destroyer, whatever it's going to be, it is not damaged, it is destroyed by a second hit onto it. But there are rules which suggest that hits are applied to the undamaged units before the damaged units. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's important to remember that twos and ones make a difference with the transporting ships and with resilience. So once we've finished the attack C units, we now go to the uh, unload transports and destroyers. So these units will go on to this island, or that island, doesn't particularly matter. We've put them up to here, and I move the artillery into place as well. With me fat fingers. So if Japan had transporting units, or if they had uh, destroyers, to move units into Santa Isabel as well, then they would put their units onto there, and a land battle would take place. Or an airfield battle could take place. So we've reset now to the island of Santa Isabel. Let's just pretend it was Japanese controlled. Well, it was Japanese controlled. And we're going to put the American bomber over the airfield for the attack airfields phase of this um, attack land units and airfields. Don't have to put it physically over there, but we have to assign what attacks the airfields and what attacks the um, other land units in this space. Japan would um, roll their dice first going into battle. They may or may not saw hits against the Americans. America can also use their battleship and their cruisers to join in to the land battle. Similar to the artillery can shoot out to sea, some of the naval units can shoot back onto the land units to support the battles there. Again, Japan could use their fleet that's in here to support that battle as well. So the attack land units will go in the same fashion as what we've seen before, rolling the dice in the box, checking the numbers across on this bottom infantry, and poor Mr. Japan here will get lost straight away. He may or may not have done his damage beforehand. Let's just remove all this Japanese fleet out of the water for convenience sake. And look at the attacking of the air base that's here. Attacking air bases is done differently to the attacking the land units, but it's a very similar fashion because there's no register on here for the um, airfield itself. What you do is you take the normal number of dice, you have to score two hits on the airfield to cause damage to it. The end of that battle will change the control of this island. So control of Santa Isabel being taken by the Americans in this phase affects the um, rest of the game and supplies and uh, reinforcement tokens, etc. That comes up in the regroup phase pretty much now. So we get on to the regroup phase now. Nothing here that's, that's difficult to, to work out. You just got to put your head around it a little bit. We've got to determine the control of the island. This island clearly is in American control because it has enough land battle numbers to be able to control this island. So that will become from Japanese into American control. They may or not capture this airfield. It's not the same thing. It's not a free meal ticket. To capture the airfield that's on this island and any supplies that might be left lying around there can be no Japanese land units on here for America to catch it. I know we're doing this from the American point of view, but it's easier because of the way the board is orientated. America land would not be able to use this, this air base because it's still Japanese controlled, even though they have got the um, they have got most of the island controlled themselves, the Americans, Japan still control the air base. If they were wiped out in this attack, America could steal the supplies, no Japan, Japanese is there, and this air base is now usable by this American bomber to land on, or these fighters even, to come across and land on. Because when it comes down to the land agents, simple as that, they bombers have the three spaces, fighters have two spaces, back to a air base, there isn't one there, we haven't put one on, but they can land onto their carrier. Simple as that. Bomber can land in this captured one, no problem at all with that. Or it can fly back to its 
um, home base card down there off camera. We then get around to building air bases. How do you build air bases? You need to have three supplies. You can use a capture supply, whatever it is, and you can use three supplies to build a new air base on an island. In here, America begin with three supplies and an air base on here already. That begins in Guadalcanal, off camera, out of shot. What am I pointing that out for? There is no air base over here, but they, they could use the air base, the supplies here, the Americans, and they could use some stolen supplies from Japan, provided there was no Japanese left on this island, to build one over here if they wanted to as well. Or they could save the supplies and transport them at a later date up to Santa Isabel. You then come to the reinforce, repair and deploy phase of the game. Really, really simple way of doing it. There are a number of reinforcement points available. The original version in the book was wrong and the Rata quickly corrected it. You get 10 reinforcement points as a base number plus four reinforcement points for each island that you control. At the beginning of the game, America have control of this one island. Japan have more than that, one, two, three, four, five islands. So America grabbing control of places quickly is gonna be beneficial. But initially, America say would have 10 points plus four points for control of Guadalcanal. They can use those to buy new units, to repair their damaged units, or to buy supplies. And this is the reinforce, repair, and deploy phase. Deploy is a novel concept, because from your base card, let me just grab the American one, put it into somewhere you can see it. This is your normal, this is an American base card, but as I say, Japan would go first on the first turn. Your units get placed into your islands or into your seas around your, your base card and get moved out from there. On the deploy, however, you can use one supply to move your unit into here before the usual movement phase. It happens now in the deploy phase. You can put one into this C zone in your deploy phase. If you were to spend two supplies to move one unit, you can move it into this phase and three supplies can get a unit over to this space in this deploy part of the phase. It fast tracks you through. And believe me, whilst it is expensive to buy the number of units, the number of supply units required to move a ship over to here beforehand, it is an effective technique of fast tracking your units forward across the board and putting the willies up the opposition. Afterwards, you then go into step number five, score victory points. Victory points are scored. If we've taken out a capital ship, as we mentioned, you'll get a, a, a single victory point for that from the previous part of the combat phase. But for every intact airfield that you have, you will score one victory point. Generally speaking, America start with one over here, Japan start with one way over there and you'll be building them quite quickly and try to damage the oppositions because um, the points keep tumbling forward. You are forever scoring points. You only need 15 to win the game and it happens usually within about an hour and a half, two hours, depending on how, how thinkingness you want to put into this game. From there, you pass the first turn marker and the I go, you go reverses. Okay, there are more rules than just that, but there are the, the caveats, the small things that you might want to look up and read a couple of times, um, but they are the major trip hazards, the ones that caught me out, had me flicking through the, the uh, rule book several times on my, my first couple of run throughs. And I, I suggest you, you play this game out of the box for the first couple of playthroughs. Play both sides a couple of ways around, get a good feel for it, and you'll start to see some patterns form in the game so at that point in time definitely explore the tech the, uh, the appendix one optional rules and you can you can mix them and match them you can take a, 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 a asymmetrical um, 
attitude towards it, take more for one side than the other. You can pull them at random, you can have the whole lot and see what you can do with them. Um, because those advantages are the, the meat and potatoes of the game, because you'll see a juicy full toss off of that outside of the off stump and it turns into a googly because someone thrown down a token and it leaves your plans all at sea, it really does. Um, and then obviously when you've done that, go back and play the out of the box version and just see how different that game comes out again without those advantages being being brought into the game. It really does um, have, have a nice, it reminds me to a small degree of the, the, the revised edition where the national advantages in there make a big difference depending on who gets what and how many you decide to play with this time. It's the same with Gradle Canal. Those advantages can, can, can give you a different game every time you play it. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful. Until next time, be cool.